As one of the most long-standing and successful motor companies Britain has ever known, Vauxhall, alongside other great names of the car industry, makes up the foundation of the nation's unique motoring heritage. Over the years, Vauxhall has produced a plethora of models, ranging from military transport and sports cars to family and commercial vehicles, and today we have the pleasure of exploring a handful of the most celebrated of these models. However, before we delve into a full inspection of our first featured model, let's just take a few moments to uncover the history that lies behind the famous Vauxhall name and reveal the events that have made the company what it is today. Interestingly, Vauxhall Motors can trace its lineage back to South London in the late 19th century, where Vauxhall Ironworks produced a single-cylinder petrol engine for the Jabberwock, a small river launch. Vauxhall's first production motor car made an appearance in 1903 with a non-reversing two-speed vehicle that featured a five-horsepower engine, believed to be a direct descendant of the engine developed for the Jabberwock. Soon, Vauxhall, which also designed and manufactured other types of engines and machinery specifically for marine equipment, developed a separate division to concentrate on motor car production because it was feared the cars could be compromised by the diversity of the company's products. This decision gave way to the birth of Vauxhall Motors Limited. Going in to produce some great sporting successes and what is now perhaps Vauxhall's most renowned vintage motor, the Prince Henry, the company went from strength to strength and, akin to other car manufacturers of the time, Vauxhall also played a significant wartime role in the conflicts of both the First and Second World Wars. The Vauxhall plant at Luton where the company had moved in 1905 as part of a major expansion programme, was heavily involved in the development of World War II aircraft, most notably the Halifax, Mosquito and Lancaster bombers and the jet engine. Unfortunately, and of course only to be expected, the Luton factory became a prime enemy target. In 1940, the German bombers were right on target, Vauxhall Luton suffered a heavy bombardment with 39 members of staff losing their lives, a tragic consequence of the valuable war work Vauxhall were undertaking. After the war, having previously moved away from making grand and exclusive performance cars, Vauxhall production was gradually re-established and a succession of reliable quality cars suitable for the mass motoring market streamed off the production line. However, with only the best part of an hour to explore the finest and most memorable of these models, let's now move on to the first featured vehicle of the programme to discover the ins and outs of what has made Vauxhall cars so appealing to the masses. Some classic car models have exotic sounding names, whereas others are known by combinations of letters and numbers, yet these less instantly memorable models are often the best kept secret treasures of the vintage motoring world. This is definitely true of Vauxhall's 1398, which only the discerning classic car enthusiast will probably have ever heard of. The Vauxhall 3098 was in production between 1913 and 1922 and this remarkable specimen in striking red was manufactured in 1924. 
This was part of a new generation of Vauxhall cars, thanks to the inspired design work of L. H. Pomeroy, an engineering genius. As the 20th century advanced, Lawrence Pomeroy persuaded the management at Vauxhall that they needed to back a new sports car and look for success on the fast developing Grand Prix racing circuits and in automobile trials. The result was the fondly named Prince Henry, first built in 1910, the forerunner to this truly lovely 3098 which could achieve speeds of up to 70 miles per hour. Incidentally, if you're trying to think of an English Prince Henry from this period in history, you're on the wrong track. The name actually came from a motoring reliability trial, the Tour of Prussia, a prestigious event that tested the competitors over 1200 miles. The Prince of Prussia who instigated the trials was Henry, and as the Vauxhalls performed so well, they were nicknamed the Prince Henry in his honour. From the outset, the 3098 was considered better, faster and more practical than the Prince Henry, and even the earliest examples could reach 100 miles per hour stripped out in racing form. In the first instance, the Vauxhall 3098 boasted a four-cylinder, simple but effective side valve engine that entered production in 1919 after the First World War. Although solidly built, weighing in at 2,690 pounds, the car was a touch on the heavy side, but it was undeniably a fast drive with impressive performance and good road handling capabilities. The only downside was the expensive price tag at 1,670 pounds, which at the time placed the 3098 in the same category as the Bentley 3 litre. This was a car for the serious driver, with plenty of money at their disposal to indulge a passion for speed, and with an engine capacity of over 4,500 cc's, they were never going to be disappointed. There were about 270 cars manufactured before there was a major design change in 1922, and, as this 3098 dates back to 1924, it falls into this newer category. Known as the OE type rather than the E type model, the main change was to the engine, which was converted to overhead valve operation. The brake horsepower rose from 90 to a rousing 115, and the performance definitely reflected this. However, despite the 3098's excellent speed, it didn't benefit from four-wheel brakes, and a modification was made in 1926 to offer a 120 brake horsepower version, thankfully with four-wheel brakes to control it. The last of the 3098's was produced in 1927, after 312 models of this particular variant had been unleashed on the motoring world, but the wind of change had been blowing from across the Atlantic. The American automobile giant General Motors, which had been evolving since 1897, made a bid for the Luton-based Vauxhall. The English company was paid $2.5 million by the president of General Motors, A.P. Sloan Jr., and the future of Vauxhall post-World War I was assured. However, for the Vauxhall 3098 and Lawrence Pomeroy's sporty designs in the higher price bracket, it was the end of the line. Once GM had taken over the Luton site, car design and development was aimed at the mass motoring market. By 1930, the first product of the merger, the Cadet, came in under the £300 mark, a big reduction when you compare it with the 3098's £1,670 some ten years earlier. 
driving was made more straightforward, with the introduction of voxels with synchromesh gearboxes and the pioneering spirit so bravely introduced with the 3098 was lost in favour of practicality as GM never allowed Vauxhall to experiment on this scale again. It's a real bonus to be able to offer a rare 3098 in this programme on Vauxhalls, particularly one as loved and treasured as this classic car, carefully preserved by its present owner as a legacy for future generations of Vauxhall enthusiasts to enjoy. By the mid-1930s, Vauxhall had firmly established itself within Britain's motoring industry and with approximately 6,000 employees working at its Luton factory, the company were preparing to introduce the D-Range. With its previous move away from the upmarket sector and into producing more practical and economic vehicles, the arrival of Vauxhall's more contemporary models the DX and DY would reaffirm its indelible imprint on the mass motoring market. Today, we have the opportunity to explore this fine 1937 DX Vauxhall. With its 14 horsepower, six cylinder engine, the DX model was also known as the 146, whilst Vauxhall's DY designation was assigned to the 126 models. Having been in its current owner's hands for roughly the past 10 years, this particular model has been completely rebuilt from what was once a heap of parts to this excellent restored classic. In its time, the car would have sold for around £220, making its family-friendly image even more alluring to the 1930s motorist. Adding further to the Vauxhall 14's appeal, was the replacement of the then conventional solid front axle and semi-elliptic springs with the Dubonnet style independent front suspension. Originally designed by Frenchman Gustave Chedru, the development of the suspension system was financed by ex-motor car racer André Dubonnet. In order for Vauxhall to implement the independent front suspension, General Motors, who'd taken Vauxhall over in 1925, licensed a simplified version of the Dubonnet design to be built. Being among Britain's first medium-priced cars to have independent front suspension, the 14.6 not only broke new ground for Vauxhall itself, but also for the whole of Britain's general motoring public. Promoted as the car that could step over bumps and with advertising slogans that read Don't ride, glide, Vauxhall made sure its new model was a more than suitable replacement for its predecessor, the Light 6. The Light 6, introduced in 1933, had proved to be an unprecedented success for Vauxhall 
with 250 of the vehicles leaving the Luton factory on the very first day of its release. After its launch, records show that 40% of all 14 horsepower cars on the road in the UK were Vauxhalls, which was largely down to the popularity of the Light 6. With sales exceeding 20,000 in 1934, as well as an annual company turnover of 7 million, the DX and DY range had a lot to live up to. But with Vauxhall's careful planning and hard work, this challenge was easily met. In 1935, during the first year of release, the DX and DY models quantified their success by leading company sales to rise well beyond 25,000 cars. Also on offer during this successful sales year was a 14 horsepower deluxe saloon model with sliding roof and a no draft Fisher ventilation system. In 1937, the Vauxhall 14 underwent a restyle, producing what today has been classed as the Series 2. Vauxhall's DX range now included the 14 horsepower deluxe saloon, priced at £215, a slightly more expensive 14 horsepower deluxe touring saloon, and also the 14 horsepower Grosvenor Foursome Coupe that could be bought for the sum of £275. Also at this time, road tax for a 14 horsepower vehicle of any make was around £10.10, .10 shillings. so altogether purchasing a Vauxhall 14 DX model was not a bad buy. Whilst retaining a cable braking system, the improved features of the Series 2 included a waterfall grille that replaced the Series 1 mesh grille easy clean wheels that replaced the wire wheels and the addition of a camshaft driven windscreen wiper assembly. As the dawn of the Second World War approached, Vauxhall switched its efforts to manufacturing equipment and vehicles for the armed forces and civilian production was suspended. After the conflicts, however, motor production picked back up again and Vauxhall continued its pre-war model line in the form of the H, I and J types. The I type was launched in 1938 to replace the 12 horsepower DY model and featured an improved engine, whilst the J type, launched in 1939, continued Vauxhall's 14 horsepower series and retained the six-cylinder engine of the DX range. Differences between the J and DX models included the incorporation of a three-speed fully synchronized gearbox and an integral body construction, which made the J-type considerably lighter and, in turn, cheaper to run. Although today, this hasn't deterred the 21st century enthusiast from appreciating the qualities of the Vauxhall DX. Noted for its smooth operation and comfortable design, the 14.6 with its independent front suspension marked a first for Vauxhall, promoting success and widespread popularity. Today, now seen in a more nostalgic light, the unique character and craftsmanship of this fabulous car is admired by many defines a momentous period in Vauxhall's history.
There's something definitely nostalgic about the appearance of the Vauxhall 10. In point of fact, it's everything you would expect to see in a motor car from the 1930s boom years. The age of steam, with the general public travelling everywhere by train, was beginning to spiral into a decline as automobiles for the masses started to become a viable alternative. The middle classes were thoroughly enjoying being able to drive themselves around the countryside and Vauxhall, relatively recently acquired by General Motors, focused on this new and very lucrative area of the market. The Vauxhall 10 was truly trailblazing as it was the first British manufactured car to incorporate an integral body and chassis to great effect. From the point of view of the drive of the car, the ride was much quieter as noise levels were drastically reduced by the revolutionary design. Unusually, this was a major technological advance that actually reduced the cost of production, which Vauxhall very wisely passed on to the consumer. With a remarkably reasonable price tag at £168, Remember, the 3098, which we've already had a look at from the 1920s, retailed at 1670 the Vauxhall 10 was set to become a phenomenal success. Also, the Vauxhall 10 was a 10 for a very good reason. When it was introduced in 1937, engine size mattered. It was restricted by taxation and a 10 horsepower vehicle meant that it fitted into a lower rated tax class. However, Vauxhall very shrewdly kept the engine size small whilst creating a car that had the feel of a much larger, more prestigious vehicle and the plan worked. When the motoring press got hold of the first Vauxhall 10 to road test, they were suitably impressed, and many a newly launched modern car would be envious of the reviews this revolutionary Vauxhall received. The Motor magazine, the What Car of its day, said, This is an extraordinary car. It seats four in comfort, exceeds 42 miles per gallon, and cannot fail to become one of the most popular cars on the British market. It was an accurate prediction indeed, because in the first five months, 10,000 Vauxhall 10s were sold, and the customers who took delivery of their precious vehicles were delighted with their purchases. The Vauxhall 10 was in production for a total of three years and 55,000 were sold on a worldwide basis. They were surprisingly popular in New Zealand and Australia, where even today you'll find classic car collectors with a Vauxhall 10 numbered amongst their prized possessions. As we take a close-up look at this much-loved Vauxhall 10 in the heart of the English countryside, we've the perfect opportunity to consider exactly what made this particular model of Vauxhall so popular, beyond the obvious price considerations. When Vauxhall came up with the design for the 10, the goal had been to produce a car that would have independent front suspension and a low weight-to-size ratio. The front suspension was courtesy of enclosed torsion bars, and this, combined with semi-elliptic rear springs, made for an extremely comfortable ride. This was considered to be the ultimate modern car when compared to the opposition. It's hard to imagine today, but the Vauxhall 10 relied upon a three-speed gearbox, yet it was still capable of producing 75 miles per hour quite an achievement for the time and, thankfully with effective hydraulic brakes, it was a very safe vehicle for the ever-improving open roads of Britain. For the style conscious, this delightful car boasted full leather upholstery and there were even models with what was termed in the 1930s as a sunshine roof. More powerful models eventually superseded the Vauxhall 10 when the road tax was no longer charged in relation to horsepower, but more on that subject will follow when we look at the next Vauxhall selected for this programme. However, 
It mattered little that Vauxhall, under the control of General Motors, had moved with the times, evolving to lead the way in the family car market, because the world was about to change beyond recognition and there was nothing anyone could do about it. When Adolf Hitler stormtrooped his way into Poland in 1939, the British government had no alternative but to declare war on Germany. Britain became a nation at war, and the Vauxhall plant at Luton in Bedfordshire had more important things to worry about than designing and manufacturing the perfect family car. During the six years of the Second World War, the Luton factory did continue to produce the Vauxhall 10, but only a hundred of them for government use, compared to the quarter of a million 4x4 trucks that were produced for the army. Also tanks were in very short supply, and Vauxhall was called upon to rise to the challenge. The Churchill tank was created from drawing board to full production at Luton in just a year, which was a Herculean achievement. In all, 5,640 Churchill tanks were manufactured by Vauxhall, and 3,000 of the 38-tonne mighty battle machines were returned to Luton for running repairs after sustaining damage during active service. This particular example of a Churchill tank is a long way from home, in Normandy, where it stands as a memorial commemorating the D-Day landings of 1944. As an interesting postscript on Vauxhall's war efforts, it wasn't only tanks that were produced, every department found itself in the firing line as the body shop manufactured more than 5 million fuel cans, 4 million rocket engine parts and 3 quarters of a million helmets. Even the design and styling team found themselves working on camouflage, inflatable decoy trucks and string and canvas decoy aircraft. Returning to our classic Vauxhall 10, it's evident that the ingenuity of the designers behind its groundbreaking new style were very talented indeed. And when the war cry called the staff of Vauxhall to arms, they served their country with honour and pride. As our next proud owner presents his wonderfully restored Vauxhall J-Type, it may be difficult, initially, to see much difference between this model and the previous two Vauxhalls we've seen on parade. This is because although his J-Type, dating back to 1948, is most definitely in the post-war category, it owes its design and styling to both the Vauxhall 14 and the Vauxhall 10 of the pre-war era. It would also have perhaps been helpful if these three crucial models in the Vauxhall story had been different colours, but we've had black, black and then more black. It would no doubt delight that great motoring mogul Henry Ford, but when it comes to classic treasures like ones featured in this programme, choice is always limited to what survived. Also, it's important to remember that we're dealing with the period of history immediately prior to the Second World War and directly after, so black would, without question, have been the most common colour used in British car manufacturing, regardless of make or model. 
When the war finally came to an end in 1945, the British car industry had to pick up where it had left off six years earlier. Also, drivers were still strictly rationed with petrol coupons right up until 1950, and the government decreed that the majority of cars to come off the newly reopened production lines, including Vauxhalls from Luton, were exported to improve the country's bank balance. There was no room for design, innovation or anything fancy, and for Vauxhall, modification of the 10 and 14 models proved to be their starting point. Eventually, the government changed car taxation from a horsepower related system to a flat rate system, and the classic Vauxhall 10 could logically be upgraded with a more powerful engine. Firstly, the H type with its 12 horsepower took over from the 10, and then came the J type, which you see here today. This particular model is one of the last, having been manufactured in 1948, the final year of the J-Type's production. The Don't Ride Glide principle still held true, and with minor modifications rather than design innovations, the J-Type offered a number of improvements. Already enjoying the benefits of light handling thanks to the integral body construction, the addition of the extra horsepower with the 1781cc six-cylinder engine gave the J-Type an extra edge. In fact, the J-Type is often called the Vauxhall J146 as a direct result of the configuration. For the discerning driver, other modifications included the luxury of an adjustable steering column, adjustable footrests and double action shock absorbers. And all this was available for the competitive price of £220. Between 1938 and 1948, 30,511 Vauxhall J-Types were produced, and had any of the original owners kept one of these classic cars, they would be delighted at what their investment would net them today. Collecting classic cars can be an absolute joy, and the car you see here being put through its paces has brought great pleasure to its owner. Unusually, when the car was purchased five years ago, most of the original bodywork was intact, with only a small amount of rust. The majority of cars of this type have required extensive restoration, and few with as many original features as this model actually exist. This is most definitely reflected in the value of the car, as this owner has at least doubled his investment in a very short space of time. However, as you can see for yourself, this is a mere technicality. This has been a question of finding an old, forgotten treasure and lovingly bringing it back to life. The joy of saving a classic car and the challenge of keeping it in the best possible condition is truly what it's all about. It's very gratifying for this owner to know the monetary value of this vehicle, but it's been a labour of love and parting him from his car would be no easy task. It's also interesting to ask classic car owners for their top tips, and in this case it was concerning that dreaded scourge of the motorist of any era, rust. With this J-Type, life was made a lot easier, because there was minimal rust damage and prevention is always better than cure. OK, if you're happy to take on a complete restoration project, that's fine. But if you're taking your first steps towards classic car collecting, you might be glad of a few tips on how to spot potential rust problems before you buy. It's always worth getting to know other classic car owners. They're a friendly lot and better than any manual or encyclopedia. Many classics have specific problem rusting areas due to design factors, and fellow enthusiasts will point you in the right direction. But there are some useful general pointers that the owner of this beautiful J-Type has suggested. Front wings always need careful scrutiny when it comes to rust. Likewise, the areas immediately around the headlamps. 
Always watch out for seals leaking around the windscreen because this will cause extensive corrosion. Doors are a little easier to cope with as they can be replaced if the model you've chosen isn't too obscure, but do check that the door frames are okay. Always be wary of a seller who won't let you give a suspect area a gentle prod. And make sure you lift the carpet in the boot to check the floor and the rear wheel arches. If you're in any doubt, walk away and wait until you can find the soundest rust-free option. This wonderful J-Type is a perfect example of what can be achieved with a good purchase in the first place. So take your time and be realistic about your restoration abilities. If there was little development immediately after the war in the design department at Vauxhall, it didn't take long for the creative juices to flow once more. The people of Britain were enjoying peace in their time, and the utilitarian make-do-and-mend principles of the war years gave way to indulgence, luxury and style. Our next Vauxhall is the epitome of elegance and post-war chic, and you can really get a sense of British optimism from this classic 1956 Velox. The first Velox appeared in 1948, alongside the Wyvern, and the Vauxhall 10, 12 and 14 were phased out. The Wyvern retained the 12 horsepower engine from the H-Type, but the Velox L-Type was given a completely new 2.2-litre six-cylinder engine. There was a growing fascination for things American, and of course the wartime alliance had done much to warm transatlantic relations. Just as Britain was enjoying a design revolution, so were the Americans. And with Hollywood influencing cinema goers once again and television beginning to make an impact, American style was something to aspire to. The first of the Veloxes showed the earliest signs of this American influence on British car design. There was a distinctly racy front end and fared in headlights, but the steering column gear change was probably the most notable transatlantic import at this stage. Looking at this Velox today, it's evident that Vauxhall were on the right track. This model, known as the E-Type, was restyled in 1951. And between its debut and the end of production in 1957, 342,000 of the newer styled cars had been manufactured at the Vauxhall factory in Luton. With a new, 
full-width body shell design that boasted stylish front wings and distinctive lights, the Velox was a hit with the increasing numbers of British motorists taking to the road for pleasure as well as convenience. By 1953, Vauxhall, just like the rest of Great Britain, had put the war years firmly in the past and a new sense of glamour was being celebrated. It was the company's golden jubilee and they'd come an incredibly long way in just 50 years. From the first Vauxhall of 1903, with its five horsepower chain-driven horizontal engine and no reverse gear, right through to the stylish Velox and other contemporary models, it had been a truly remarkable journey, as of course had been the entire first half of the 20th century. For Vauxhall, the future was assured. 13,000 people were employed at the Luton factory, and annual production had reached a record high of 100,000 vehicles. The millionth Vauxhall conveniently rolled off the production line in the Golden Jubilee year, which was perfect timing for the Vauxhall PR gurus of the day. Vauxhall's good fortune reflected that of the nation, and a major initiative was launched to expand. With an injection of £36 million, Vauxhall became a force to be reckoned with, and when you take a closer look at the stylish lines and classic grace of this wonderful Velox, you can see why. For this owner, this particular Velox is rather special. When we mentioned earlier that classic car owners can be, to say the least, reluctant when it comes to parting with their vehicles, we weren't joking. With its distinctive big back window and silver straw paintwork, the car was sold by this owner but he was delighted to get it back eight years ago and he certainly has no intention of parting with it again. With the early motor cars of the 20th century, it was still perceived by the average motorist that getting from A to B was as much as they could ask. But as you've seen for yourself, by the time it got to the Velox, there was much more on offer. This was, as the advertising department was keen to tell us, comfort with flexibility and the drive was something very special. With its high performance, short stroke engine, this Velox is still a delight to drive, giving the impression of power coupled with ability. And if you're looking to start your own collection of classic cars without going too far back in time, this might just be the ideal choice. Classic cars are rarely bought to be the main form of family transport, so you can let your heart rule your head to a certain degree. If you have a particular model you're looking for, try joining an appropriate car club, because you'll soon discover any that are for sale. Classic car magazines are also very useful, as are classic car shows, but do keep your eyes peeled wherever you go. Adverts in newsagents' windows, for example, can uncover a well-loved and cared-for treasure. And, of course, the internet can not only help you find the perfect classic car to buy, but also turn up all the spare parts that you're likely to need to keep your vehicle running. The Vauxhall Velux is very much a car of the post-war era of new prosperity and a valuable addition to our Vauxhall collection for this programme. It may not have the seniority of the 3098 or the nostalgic sentimentality of the Vauxhall 10s and 14s, but it has all the glamour of a 1950s Hollywood film star and a comfortable, stylish ride that is worthy of preservation for many years to come.
for our last voxel, we're coming even more up to date, as this VX490 Victor can only be described as a true 1960s machine. Produced between 1961 and 64, this sporty version of the standard Victor was very popular, and later reincarnations of the VX490 were always sporty and most definitely a discerning driver's car. As the Velox E-Type that we've just been looking at was superseded by a more streamlined glossy model in 1957, the Vauxhall, with its distinctive wraparound windscreen and four-cylinder, one-and-a-half-litre engine, came onto the scene. It was well received, and although the Victor is perhaps not the best known of all Vauxhalls, the Penchant for a little alliteration was developing nicely, as later Vivas, Venturas and Vectras could prove. Ironically, by the time the Victor made its debut just four years after Vauxhall's Golden Jubilee, the workforce had doubled and the company's annual turnover had risen to 76 million. It had taken 50 years for Vauxhall to make its first million cars. It achieved a second million by 1959. Gone were the days of the 3098 with its exclusive price tag and even more exclusive number of customers, Vauxhall had become just as GM intended, the cars of the motoring masses. With the encouragement of the government of the day, Vauxhall opened a second manufacturing plant at Ellesmere Port on Merseyside and production output increased even more dramatically. This VX490 has a great sporty look its colour scheme certainly helps. Because of the classic lines and 1960s chic, which has enjoyed a fashion revival in recent years, this will always be a highly collectible car. The drive is surprisingly good for a car of this age, although all of the Victors were rapidly updated as motoring technology surged ahead. In 1964, more powerful engines were introduced, and in 1968, a completely new Victor was created, with either a 1.6 or a 2-litre engine. With a revolutionary inclined overhead cam, driven by a neoprene belt, it was the first production car in Britain to offer this feature. In fact, as Vauxhall celebrated its Golden Jubilee, the new FD Victor enjoyed great public acclaim, as The Times called it the star of the motor show, and it was actually voted British Car of the Year. A more powerful 3.3-litre 6 was created, called the Ventura, and when Victor models were revamped once more in the 1970s, the VX490 was again the sporty option. There are a number of Vauxhall owners and drivers clubs and the VX490 does have a dedicated drivers club where enthusiasts of the FD and FE series victors are also very welcome. It's always worth checking out these organisations, as mentioned earlier, particularly for locating vehicles and spare parts. The Vauxhall VX490 Drivers Club actually publishes its own magazine and newsletter, and the events they organise can be very worthwhile and, more importantly, thoroughly enjoyable. It can't be stressed enough that other owners, whatever their chosen breed of classic car, are very useful to know. And as we enjoy watching this delightful Vauxhall VX490 taking to the open road, here are a few of the most commonly offered gems that our owners have come up with during the making of this programme. It might sound a bit boring when you're itching to get tinkering with your newly bought classic, but start a maintenance log, because it's easy to lose track of what you have, or more importantly, haven't done. Draw up a schedule of work and attend to the little things that are inexpensive as well as major servicing issues. On the subject of driving on the road, experienced classic car owners are well used to the impatience of modern speed freaks. For some reason, a classic vehicle pottering along is seen as a challenge to be overtaken at the earliest possible opportunity, whether it's safe or not. You'll have to second-guess what the idiot on your tail is going to do next, and you can't assume they'll have any notion of what you might do, especially if you have semaphore indicators. 
almost all of the drivers we've spoken to urge prospective purchasers of classic cars to work out where to store their newly acquired treasure, because they do the deed. Not only is it wise to confer with your nearest and dearest if you want to keep your work in progress on the front lawn, it can also quite literally keep you out of the divorce courts. Also, the worst thing you can do to any car, ancient or modern, is park it on grass and throw a plastic sheet over it. The damp will rise and have nowhere to go, and corrosion will be accelerated. A garage is pretty essential in most owners' opinions, or at the very least, a sheltered carport where you'll be comfortable working on your vehicle. But as we watch this Vauxhall VX490 disappearing off into the distance, it's living proof that all the work involved in restoring a classic car is well worth the effort. Sadly, our time looking at these much-loved and treasured voxels is drawing to a close, and having spanned much of the 20th century with models featured, we'll conclude by bringing the voxel story up to date. Vauxhall Corporation turned their attention to a smaller car in the 1960s, alongside the Victors and Veluxes, the other great V, the Viva, was born. With its 1,050cc engine, 100,000 Vivas were sold in less than a year, and it heralded the way of the future, a legacy that drivers are still enjoying to this day. The Viva was replaced by the first Vauxhall hatchback, the Chevette, which enjoyed regular placing in the top 10 for UK car sales. A succession of new cars appeared, the much-loved Cavalier, the Royale and the Carlton, but the 1980s brought a decline in sales due to stiff competition from import markets, and the motor industry across the board suffered a crisis of confidence. Some great old British names like Austin never recovered, being swallowed up by Rover. But General Motors was not going to let Vauxhall fall by the wayside. When others were battening down the hatches, GM came up with an immense investment programme that would take almost seven years and millions of pounds to come to fruition. The new front-wheel drive Astra proved incredibly popular and is still in production today in an up-to-the-minute 21st century evolution. In direct competition with the Ford Fiesta, the Nova entered the small car market and performed superbly, and the present-day Corsa owes a great deal to its Nova ancestry. Losses were turned into profit, and Vauxhall was a force to be reckoned with on a worldwide scale. In terms of character, originality and sheer bravery, many would argue that Vauxhall's greatest hour came during World War II, when adaptability and resilience truly did come to the fore. Others would argue that the classic design capabilities of Lawrence Pomeroy, with his majestic Prince Henry and elegant 3098, epitomised the true spirit of Vauxhall, before General Motors moved the company in a different direction. Yet few could fail to give credit to the giant American corporation that took an, albeit thriving, English cottage industry and carried it right through to the 21st century and way beyond. You only have to see the proud emblem of the Griffin to realise that Foxhall's identity will always stand testimony to its heritage. It'll take some careful pronunciation here, but the emblem belonged to a soldier of the Middle Ages, one Fouque Le Bronze, who was granted a London manor by a grateful king of England. The manor house was known as Fulks Hall, which over the years became known as Vauxhall, 
and the name stuck to the whole district, which is of course where the very first Vauxhall cars originated. For classic car owners and modern Vauxhall enthusiasts alike, the strength and endurance of the distinctive Griffin emblem on Vauxhall's well-polished livery is appropriate indeed. For as long as this mythical winged beast with the body of a lion and the head of an eagle proclaims Vauxhall's credentials, the company has every chance of creating even more classic cars for the collectors of the future. Mm -hmm.